So if you haven't read this book yet, Reagan Rising, um, those of you especially who had first-hand experience will, I think, really enjoy it. It's a wonderful uh, story that Craig Shirley tells. Uh, I think everyone knows Craig Shirley, despite your third or fourth time here at the DC uh, office for Hoover. Uh, my name is Mike Frank, and I'm the director here. And what we're going to do tonight is we're going to just do a kind of a conversational interview about different elements of the book and different themes that Craig pulls out in the book. Um, and then we'll turn it over to some Q&A from everyone here tonight. So when I was reading it, one thing I thought was very important, one important theme that comes up throughout is the, um, the ideological uh, battles that were going on within the Republican Party, within conservatism during those years. And the years, of course, 1976 to 1980, uh, where uh, candidate Reagan mounted a challenge to Gerald Ford, the incumbent president, lost by a narrow margin. And then Craig tells the story of what happened thereafter during the Carter years and going into the 1980 campaign season. Um, and let me start off, Craig, with uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this intellectual debate, and I'm going to read from uh, pages 37 8, 38 in, in your book, and then pose a question. Uh, in the 1970s, a debate was emerging, you write, inside the GOP, focusing on whether it should continue to be the tool of big business or go off in a populist direction. Okay, that sounds somewhat familiar. Leading the anti-big business charge was Reagan, supported by Senator Paul Laxalt, Pat Buchanan, other nascent debates were about economics. Battle lines were slowly forming in the GOP between the older, sober, green eye shade wearing budget balancers of the aged party and the new, young, tax cutting, life is great, entrepreneurial, let's go to the future supply siders. Reagan had begun his politics with the old timers, but he now saw that there was little in the way of hope to offer the American people. In late 76, he changed his emphasis. The Gifford became a supply sider and one of its marquee acolytes. You also cite Reagan's speech at CPAC in February of 77. The time has come to see where Reagan said, the time has come to see if it is possible to present a program of action based on political principle that can attract those interested in the so-called social issues and those interested in the economic issues. In short, isn't it possible to combine the two major segments of contemporary American conservatism into one politically effective whole? What I envision is not simply a temporary uneasy alliance but the creation of a new lasting majority. And finally, page 213, you quote Reagan again, worth mentioning here. We, meaning the GOP, are not a stodgy fraternal organization beholden to big business and the country club set. We're the party of Main Street, the small town, the farmer, the city neighborhood where the working people live. Our strength comes from the shopkeeper, the craftsman, the farmer, the cop on the beat, the fireman, the blue collar, white collar worker. Um, today's conservative movement is going through a similar kind of a gut check. We've been doing that now for a few years. <clears throat> if you go back and look at what you're writing about, Craig, any lessons that we can glean and take away from what was happening four decades ago and apply it to today? Yeah, Reagan was right and they were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me first, mm -hmm. I have to pay homage to Ed Meese. Thank you for being here today. Um, ben yeah. <laughs> Also been my friend for many, many, many years and always available for an interview. I've spent countless hours talking with Ed. He knows more about Ronald Reagan than every other Reagan mm -hmm. biographer combined. And he also did me a huge favor when I was telling him, when I was interviewing a couple of years ago about this book and we were talking about those, those mm -hmm. the wilderness years like Churchill. And, and I told him, he asked me the title of the book and I told him the working title and he laughed and he said, I won't, I won't tell people what it was. <laughs> he laughed so, so loudly. I said, OK, I'm going to change the title of the book. <laughs> so I changed the title of the book, thanks to Ed. <laughs> so thank you. So, he's been a great influence on everything. Um, the struggle goes on is that, you know, um, I guess I like to tell the story. Um, the time I was in high school physics and I didn't fall asleep, uh, I remember the college professor saying, Power can neither be destroyed nor created. It can only be moved around. And power, since the time of the New Deal, had been flowing to Washington uh, with the acquiescence, obviously, of, of the Democrats, the Great Society, the New Deal, and uh, New Frontier, and all that. And the Republicans were 
split. Mm -hmm. You know, there were there were the big government Republicans, and then there was the emerging populist conser American conservative. And I say American conservative quite deliberately because there's a vast difference between British conservatism and American conservatism. British conservatism power flows downward. It flows downward from royalty, from the moneyed bank interests in in, uh, in uh, Manchester and uh, and uh, uh, London. American conservatism mm -hmm. power flows upward from the people. And th that's why we have the term public servant. Uh, and Reagan understood this. And Reagan was obviously evolving in his thinking, but he always understood that concentrations of power lead to the diminution of personal freedom and corruption. <coughs> and Washington, by the 1970s, government is not only not working, also government is corrupt. And so he's advancing a new paradigm, a new way of looking at things that first started with Buckley. They really started with the American Revolution, but it died out over the years. And it's being reinvented by Bill Buckley. And you know, you mentioned Reagan talking about the social right and the economic right. And of course, mm -hmm. this was fusionism, yeah. which Frank Meyer and Bill Buckley and others had advanced, which is that you could merge together business interests and family interests and create a lasting, durable working majority. And so Reagan understood this. The 1970s, of course, um, it is the end of government working, or the end of people believing that government worked. You know, starting in '63, government couldn't save John Kennedy. Government couldn't later in the decade. Government couldn't save Robert Kennedy or Martin Luther King. And then in the '70s, government couldn't win the Vietnam War. Nixon resigns, which is seen as another failure of government. Uh, and then, of course, out of hyper interest rates, hyper inflation, uh, is the, the malaise of the '70s. Is that mm -hmm. Washington has great concentrations of power and wealth uh, and, and, and autonomy, but nothing is working. And so Reagan now steps into the void from 68 and 76 and from his, the governorship of California and, and talks about the new Republican Party. And he quite deliberately says new Republican Party in a speech to CPAC in 1977, in which mm -hmm. uh, you quote from. So mm -hmm. it is this, mm -hmm. plus there's a lot of fortuitous things that are coming to his assistance, which we can talk about, but Panama Canal treaties, mm -hmm. Kemp Roth, Prop 13, uh, the rise of Phyllis Schlafly and the family movement and the defeat of the ERA. All this creative revolt mm -hmm. is going on in the land to eventually produce uh, the vibrant conservative movement. And then Reagan is the avatar of that movement. You mentioned the Panama Canal Treaty. <clears throat> and one thing I was, I'm struck by, and this is in my channeling, what young people today who did not live through this probably uh, are not aware that there was such a debate yeah. over the Panama Canal. It's huge. Uh, and then you also mentioned the situation with Taiwan and communist China, the right. recognition of communist China. Right. Could you go into some of that story and why it was significant and how it maybe split the party and so on? Well, it, this is, of course, the time we lost the Vietnam War. And the feeling in the country is America's day is over, uh, is that uh, the Soviets are ascendant and we're descending and that the American century is ending, but it's ending 25 years early, uh, is that the Reagan uh, uh, Carter proposes to go ahead with the Panama Canal Treaties, which was, as he called it, the giveaway of the treaties to the, to the he called uh, mm -hmm. Omar Torrey, Torrey, yeah. Tor, uh, a, a tin pot dictator. <laughs> uh, uh, but it was the, basically the giveaway of the control mm -hmm. of the Panama Canal. Now, I remember my grandmother at the time being incensed about it. And I did, it took me a long time to realize what she was so upset about. She grew up with the Panama Canal as one of the seven wonders of the world. Mm -hmm. This was a great example of American ingenuity and know-how and, and mm -hmm. accomplishment. Mm -hmm. So, And it was often referred to as one of the seven wonders of the world. So for her, there was emotional investment. For older Americans, there was emotional investment in mm -hmm. the Panama Canal as a symbol of, of American greatness, mm -hmm. of, uh, of, uh, of manifest destiny. And, um, and, and I was against it at the time, but I didn't understand until much later how much this meant to older Americans. And it was mm -hmm. coming at a time when America is in decline. So it just was another mm -hmm. example of how America is declining in the world and declining even in its own hemisphere. And it did um, predict a couple of years in advance, I believe, the Malay speech time where 1978. That was eight, and the canal, Se canal 79, 79. And the canal treaty was right before that. Right before right? that, yeah, 78. So you kind of had a precursor to this debate about uh, can we ever get our mojo back? Is, can America be great again? And you had the president going off to the 
to Camp David, right. uh, cloistered for what, 10, 12 days? Yeah, that's right. Bringing in Christopher Lash and all these intellectuals right. and the high priests of the movements of the day. Jesse Jackson. Jesse, he brought in sports figures, he brought in political figures, he brought in cultural figures, he brought in religious figures. Mm -hmm. they, they, the, the Carter White House tried to put window dressing and called it a, a domestic summit, but mm -hmm. really, there were a lot of people who were actually concerned about mm -hmm. Carter's mental stability. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were writing about it in the newspapers because he was just cloistered there at, at Camp David just meeting with these people. And then, of course, he comes out with the, mm -hmm. with the Malay speech. So you, you have that ongoing in your book, a nice job of pulling out this th theme. And we haven't talked much about Jimmy Carter yet. Right. But the backdrop, of course, is you have a president who, in a way, came to Washington he didn't say drain the swamp, but he was trying to turn Washington upside down he in came, his own kind of. He came with very good. Way. He came with very good intentions. Yeah. In a, in a way, Carter and Reagan are plowing the same populist fields: anti-Washington, mm -hmm. anti-corruption, anti-corporate corruption. Anti corruption. Um, he's more liberal populist, and Reagan mm -hmm. obviously is more conservative populist. Reagan's first column, that uh, after Carter is sworn in in, in January '77, is basically saying, let's give Carter a chance. He's mm -hmm. got some interesting ideas. Let's not pile on right away. Let's not get into partisan bickering. Give him a chance. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that Reagan saw that Carter, you know, he came to Washington. He was going to reorganize government. He was anti-corruption. He was going to reform the tax code. Mm -hmm. uh, on, on, on all the fundamental issues, he was, he was a right of center. And uh, even vetoing the, <clears throat> those water projects is kind of like an early version of getting rid of earmarks. Yes, sort, right, right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. So he, he, he came in with certain intentions that were overlapping, but he was running right up against his own party, his own base, the rent-seeking. But classes. the Democratic Party was different than that mm -hmm. it is now. Well, it had, well, it had it had. I mean, you'd have to go back to '64. Is is that the two parties operated for many years in a state of equilibrium? Mm -hmm. So when a conservative is nominated for president, he picks a liberal to unify the party, and when a moderate like Eisenhower's nominate, he picks a conservative like Nixon. Mm -hmm. Nixon, the conservative, picks the moderate lodge. And the Democratic Party does much the same. Mm -hmm. Goldwater begins the process of reorganizing the two parties, because in 64 he picks Bill Miller, mm -hmm. little known conservative congressman from Buffalo, New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said at the time he picked uh, Bill Miller because he, uh, he pissed off LBJ more than Goldwater did. <laughs> uh, uh, but he was chairman yeah. of the Republican National Committee at the time, and he used mm -hmm. to issue these press releases tweaking LBJ all the time. Mm -hmm. So, but what he does is that is that you know don't forget mm -hmm. 1964 is that there are a lot of liberal Republicans in the Republican Party, and there are a lot of conservative Democrats in the Democratic Party. But mm -hmm. he begins the process of driving liberals like John Lindsay. Mm -hmm. You know, it goes from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. Strom Thurmond goes from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. So he mm -hmm. begins the process of the reorganization of the two parties, which is pretty much what we have today. Mm -hmm. The Republican Party tends to be more conservative. The Democratic Party tends to be more liberal. Mm -hmm. and, and is there anything else to say about um, Taiwan? That struck me as another one of those. Well, that was a flashpoint issue for the conservative movement. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Taiwan had been an, an issue since, uh, you know, the argument of who lost China. Mm -hmm. And Chang, you know, was corrupt, but he was a Western ally. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was especially uh, an important issue for Reagan because he saw Taiwan as being betrayed by the United States. And when we abrogated the uh, treaty with uh, Taiwan, uh, there was a lawsuit filed against uh, Carter, and Reagan spoke out harshly against it. Radio commentary speeches mm -hmm. uh, and columns, so uh, he was against. And eventually, in the 80 campaign, this came up, and it was a real hot mm -hmm. point issue. And he eventually came up with what became known as the Two China Policy, which was, the, if he was elected president, the, his intention was to recognize both Chinas. Mm -hmm. So you had those kinds of schisms as a backdrop to being able to espouse your version, this new emerging version of conservatism and what it meant uh, implemented, whether it was in the Panama Canal area or uh, the dealing with China. Yeah, but there's more than that. And there was a lot of, as I said before, there's mm -hmm. a lot of creative revolt in, in the land that's going on, uh, Prop 13 out in California, which oh. doesn't just, you know, everybody <laughs> knows is mm -hmm. that was the complete restructuring of property taxes. Property taxes in California have been going up like uh, uh, in mm -hmm. some cases, a thousand percent over the previous several years, mm -hmm. and uh, Prop 13, which uh, the architects were um, Howard Jarvis and Paul Gann. Mm -hmm. uh, Reagan was a supporter, but he was late to it. Mm 
Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so was Jerry Brown, who was the governor at the in time. In 1978? 78, mm -hmm. yeah, it was in June of 78. Mm -hmm. And it not only passes, it passes by 67 percent. It's, it's not a landslide, it's a, you know, it's, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's killing in the grave. And then, but, but mm -hmm. Prop 13s pop up all over the country, mm -hmm. is that many other states all of a sudden are now pushing their own state referendum. Uh, they're, they're all called, mm -hmm. you know, Prop 13 babies. Mm -hmm. So again, there's creative revolt in the land, and mm -hmm. Washington is not paying attention to any of it. That, that's an important, important. Very thing important. Develop, that they they weren't paying the, attention to Reagan. Right. Um, and so let's talk about Reagan for a second. And given that we're at the Washington D.C. office of the Hoover Institution, let me just point you to page 62, um, and you describe what you call the academic dystopia, an apocalyptic thinking of the 70s. Um, and how widespread that thinking had become. And we re referenced the Carter being um, up in Camp David and, and having potentially a mental problem, mental breakdown. But meanwhile, what was candidate Reagan doing? He spent a lot of time, as you described it, Hoover, right. at the Hoover Institution, talking to scholars. And I'm sure Ed Meese can help us fill in some of the details on those meetings and those experiences and their significance. Um, and then on page 62, you write there, he, meaning Reagan, was listening to men and women talk about lifting the American economy, lifting up the American people, and how and why it was important to defeat Soviet communism. All in all, Reagan was learning how and why the glass is half full, while Carter was learning how and why it was half empty. Yes. So here you have this candidate coming in full of optimism and, and can-do spirit. Can you talk a little bit about that, what it meant? And why it was important? Reagan uh, in 76, I mean, he's always been, he, he began his historic move to the right in the 1940s when he saw the government take up to 95% of his income. Uh, and then he saw the uh, influence of communist provocateurs with the various trade unions mm -hmm. in Hollywood. So he begins his move to the right. Between 76 and 80, I mean, he's, he's already a conservative, but Kemp Roth gives him an important message because the Republican mm -hmm. Party from 32 mm -hmm. on had been kind of the Me Too party. You know, mm -hmm. we can manage government better than the Democrats can, but it doesn't really have any new ideas. Uh, the idea party is the Democratic Party. And it, but it, it, because of Hoover, because of Heritage, because of Buckley, because of the creative re populist mm -hmm. revolt in the land, because Reagan's giving voice to all these things, is that a, a conservative movement is evolving and changing and growing and becoming, uh, uh, you know, sophisticated mm -hmm. in its ideas and concepts. And, and you know, uh, so the, the idea of tax cuts becomes very important because it fits Reagan's mm -hmm. evolving political framework, is mm -hmm. that take power away from, from Washington in the form of money and give it back to the individual, which is which is, you know, his form, his belief in federalism. Mm -hmm. uh, so this mm -hmm. and uh, other, you know, initiative and other things like that all inform him to, by 1980, he's, he's got the social right, he's got the economic right, and he's got the foreign policy right, <clears throat> all unified mm -hmm. together into a conservative majority. There's something important, though, too, which is during those years, you did a nice job describing the situation with the economy, uh, with the society in general, uh, run into all forms of turbulence socially, economically, and, and in, internationally with, the, with communism uh, and the Soviet Union. Um, it, it could have been very easy for someone like Reagan to take that and, tr and, and turn it into a, a, a very angry form of revolt as opposed right. to his, his optimistic, more right. positive style. Is, can you maybe expand yeah. a little bit on that? Yeah, you know, if, if we've all seen Reagan's speech in 64 for Goldwater. And it is, it stands as one of the great political speeches of all time, mm -hmm. right up there with William Jennings Bryant and his Cross of Gold speech. Um, but the Reagan of 1964 in that speech is often angry. He's angry at student protesters, he's angry at Lyndon Johnson, he's angry at the Great Society. Mm -hmm. Is that he's not naturally an angry person, but he was angry about mm -hmm. the state of affairs. Mm -hmm. By 1976 and 1980, he's realizing, I think, Ed can speak to this, but the, a more optimistic message, not just identify the problems. You know, mm -hmm. he was a Hollywood veteran. He knew that all scripts contained three essential elements, introduction, conflict, and resolution. Well, he had his introduction. He identified the conflict, but he hadn't come up with the, with the, with the solutions. And this, mm -hmm. the conservative movement, and his own thinking, his own informed thinking, 
uh, gives him on whether it's on the defeat of the Soviet Union. I mean, this is really radical anti-establishment thinking. Since the rise, since the rise of the Soviet Union, we had, we had, you know, after and, and Truman and Eisenhower and every other president, it was either it was containment mm -hmm. or later detente. Mm -hmm. But nobody in the right mind would say, hey, we can defeat the Soviet Union right. because that would involve you know, nuclear war. But Reagan mm -hmm. says, no, there is a different way to defeat the Soviet Union without involving, without involving war. Is that he's the first national leader to actually articulate that we can defeat the Soviet Union and, and the Warsaw Pact will fall de, de facto if we defeat Moscow. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the same mm -hmm. thing with uh, the, the social right, although less so, but, uh, but also with the economic right, because he also understands that um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a linkage between economy and foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And to have a muscular foreign policy, you have to have a strong defense. And to have a strong defense, you have to have a vibrant economy. Mm -hmm. um, let's switch gears one more time. And all throughout the, the book, you must come back to it <clears throat> in some ways more than almost any other theme. And the theme is, um, maybe in four words, is you know, let Reagan be Reagan. You talk about the campaign the structure. And there's an, an individual there who, again, the young people here probably never heard of, a guy named John Sears. <laughs> who figures very prominently in this, uh, in this drama. And smiling. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> can you talk a little bit about what was going on there and, and the strategy that evolved with respect to using or not using uh, the go then governor, ex-governor Reagan in the campaign yeah. and how that resolved itself? The, the world is so different now, it's hard to describe <clears throat> what it was even 40 years ago. You know, in, in the 1970s, California was a long way away. You didn't, I mean, there's no internet. There's no, mm -hmm. no satellite television, or it was, but it wasn't accessible to mm -hmm. ordinary citizens. Is that, you know, you, you didn't, you know, you pick up the phone and call California, it costs a lot of money, you'd be better off. Mm -hmm. And Reagan is governor of California, and that's way out there. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the guys mm -hmm. in California, Ed and, and Mike and Lynn and others, are somewhat intimidated by national politics. I think that's fair. Is that Sears was just come off the, the uh, Nixon campaign in 68 and got high marks for being the chief delegate hunter. Mm -hmm. um, but Sears, now by 1974 and 75, Nixon's resigned. Sears, the, the, the Ford people don't want him. He wants to manage a national campaign badly. Mm -hmm. And so he, he gets introduced by an intermediary to Reagan, uh, flies out to California, meets with Ed and everything else, and, and, he, and he passes muster. So he becomes, because they, they recognize he had national political experience, and none of them did. It's all California-based. Mm -hmm. So that's how he became Reagan's manager. But they had uh, constant battles mm -hmm. uh, to the point where in 1980 mm -hmm. um, is that Sears was like John Mitchell, who was for a time his mentor in the, in the Nixon White House. But hmm. John Mitchell hated anybody with, a, with a closer access to Nixon than he did. And so Sears, by 1980, is getting rid of Lynn Knopfsinger and Marty Anderson and all the other <clears throat> familiar faces that Reagan liked to see when he got up in the morning. Mm -hmm. So now the last, no, but the last Reaganite standing <clears throat> is Ed Meese. Mm -hmm. And Reagan and Sears and Mrs. Reagan and a couple others have a meeting until late into the night, 2 o'clock in the morning in, in Manchester, New Hampshire. And they're insisting, and Dick Allen's also been forced out. They're insisting that Ed has to go. And finally, Reagan stands up and he gets furious and he says, damn it, why, John, do you have to always have your way? Why can't I have my way? And he takes a step toward Sears. And, uh, and, uh, and Charlie Black is there and he thinks that Reagan is going to punch out John Sears. <laughs> And so he steps up mm -hmm. and steps between them. And Mrs. Reagan's pulling on Reagan's arm saying, Ronnie, Ronnie, come away, come away, come away. And he's still screaming. You know, you're not getting Ed, you're not getting Ed, you're not getting Ed. And so finally, Sears backed down, and then he was gone from the campaign a week later. And Which is another whole story. Yeah, you can also explain the things that he, his strategy of not, of not letting Reagan go out and do the, yeah. The meeting with the voters. Yeah, yeah, there was one time Reagan wanted to, wanted to give a speech on abortion, and Sears said, look, Governor, that can be your private opinion, but he can't go out and talk about it. And Reagan got furious. He said, mm -hmm. damn it, John, this is my campaign, not yours. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they had constant. Sears was in, 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 let me pay, also say some good stuff about John. Charlie Black once told me that if 
Reagan hadn't hired Sears and fired Sears, he never would have been president of the United States. Mm -hmm. Hiring John in 75 was, uh, gave Reagan, the, uh, the, the national media really liked John Sears, and if John Sears saw something special in Ronald Reagan, then there must have been something special in Ronald Reagan. So mm -hmm. that gave him the, the imprimatur of acceptability, mm -hmm. is that, but then, and, and he did some brilliant things in 76. Picking Dick Schweiker was a brilliant, brilliant thing. It kept the campaign alive for three weeks when everybody else in 76 said mm -hmm. Reagan's campaign was over. He did some other brilliant was things. Was that Sears' idea? Yeah, that was all Sears' mm -hmm. idea. Yeah, that was all Sears' <laughs> idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and he did some other things, too. Uh, he did some other things, made some mistakes, too. And I don't want to get too much in the weeds, but, but, but by 1980, I want to say that Reagan had outgrown Sears, but Sears' ego had outgrown the campaign. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so there was a congressional meeting, you know, because Reagan's campaign was going very, very badly in the early days of 70, in, in 79 and 80. Mm -hmm. And a bunch of Reagan's congressional supporters want to, you know, they demand the Sears come on the carpet down here in Washington because they want to they know what the hell is going on with the campaign. Mm -hmm. And so Sears ducks the meeting at the last minute and they send Charlie Black and these 30 congressional supporters peel black skin off and uh, you know, basically said, said to him, tell John to stop worrying about his own damn press and start worrying about Reagan's press. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. it's, every campaign has those sorts of moments and that was, it's interesting the way you frame it that he made two decisions with respect to John Sears in some ways opposite ones but they were both the right ones at the time. Yes, they were, yeah. yes yeah. they were, yeah. Okay, um, maybe at this point I have a feeling there may be more than one or two questions in the, in the audience. Yes, <laughs> Preston, we see you. So how about we turn to questions and um, keep them succinct and maybe there's a question mark at the end of the, of the sentence. Uh, <laughs> Preston, we'll get a test of that on you. I've got a definite question. So <laughs> on the abortion issue, I understand that Ronald Reagan, is, as governor of California, was <clears throat> pro-abortion, or at least legalized abortion. But when he... He signed a bill. He signed the bill. So, but when he decided to run for, for president, he realized he needed to have a national strategy. And then he came to his pro-life position by analyzing the right to private property. Is that accurate? Uh, I hadn't heard that before, but, that's, but it very well may be true. I think there was an evolution in his thinking, like there was an evolution in a lot of people's thinking. He signed in 1970, I think, was it the Family Protection Act? It was, it was uh, 60, 68. 68. But it, was, but it was billed as aid to poor and dependent families, and he was never really, you know, told that it actually had uh, an, an abortion feature in the, in the bill. And he always regretted signing that. And he said he always regretted mm -hmm. signing it. I think that he came, like a lot of people, George Bush started out as pro-life and later evolved into a... Uh, no, pro-choice. Pro-choice. Uh, George Bush started out as pro-choice and evolved into a pro-life position. Uh, so I, I, do, I give Reagan the benefit of the doubt. I think that he, he realized that uh, uh, it was before sonograms and technology, but I think he, uh, he realized that, and by the way, he was going to the losing side of the issue, is that a vast majority or at least plurality of Americans supported abortion. So it wasn't political opportunism mm -hmm. that he went from being, uh, from signing, he never articulated he was <laughs> pro-choice. He never gave a speech about pro-choice. Um, and uh, I don't think he ever really thought about it until it kind of, reach a crescendo in the, uh, after uh, Roe v. Wade, and then grassroots activity took, you know, took hold uh, uh, against Roe. And Craig, on that point, would the Republican Party in those years have been leaning one way, one way or the other? The That's good, um, is that there were, in 76, <clears throat> of course, Betty mm -hmm. Ford is the first lady, and mm -hmm. she's pro-abortion. And she gives the scandalous interview with 60 Minutes. Mm -hmm. And it really scandalized everybody. Mm -hmm. She said that she wouldn't object to her daughter have, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't know what exactly, I, I know, I pretty know, pretty know, uh, pretty much know what she said. Uh, but it basically that if her, if her daughter, Susan, had an affair with a married man, she'd understand it. She came out for the ERA, she came out for mm -hmm. abortion, mm -hmm. and this really, damaged Ford in the spring of 1975 mm -hmm. and it sent family groups and pro-life leaders and pro-family leaders into Reagan's arms for the upcoming primaries and he mm -hmm. was really, really helped. Well, what's interesting is that in the fall of 76, Jimmy Carter is kind of playing coy on the abortion issue but he's running definitely from the pulpit. He's running as a born-again Christian. Uh, he's, he's invoking Christ and, and Jesus and he gets something like 60% of the evangelical vote 
in America in 1976, mm -hmm. a Democrat, mm -hmm. getting 60% of the evangelical vote. Mm -hmm. But they went yeah. from Reagan in the primaries to Carter in the general election. Mm -hmm. well, and the other thing along those lines, just real quick, <clears throat> it seems like that period you're writing about in this book saw the emergence of individual outsiders who were able to shape debates in ideological and substantive ways like right. that. Phyllis Schlafly is an example yes. of that. Yeah. Um, and, and Reagan, <coughs> is it fair to say Reagan understood that and tapped into that in ways that other candidates either either maybe they didn't want to because they didn't agree with the substance or they just didn't understand the power of you know, these, these associations of citizens who Reagan wanted. always understood the value of the spoken word going back mm -hmm. to Eureka College. In fact, he said he, he, he understood the power of of, of the spoken word and, and mm -hmm. the political speech when he gave uh, a speech as a sophomore opposing the firing of um, a bunch of professors at Eureka College. And it was there, that was kind of his political mm -hmm. awakening. So, mm -hmm. and, and Screen Actors Guild, and then later as governor, commentator. So he understood that long before, but what is happening in, 19, in the 70s um, is, I mean, it's a combination of so many things. Carter uh, is, uh, is a foot-washing Baptist. And he believes, as a Baptist, that you're supposed to sacrifice on earth. You don't dance. You don't, you don't smoke. You don't drink. He banned alcohol in the White House. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't smoke. You don't dance. You don't drink. Uh, all these things because you have to sacrifice here on earth in order to ascend to heaven. And this, mm -hmm. this Baptist, this foot-washing Baptist view combines with the, with the dystopia of the 1970s. You remember the 70s, the population bomb, mm -hmm. the culture of narcissism, uh, the greening of America, uh, book after book late, after the book. The great planet Earth. Exactly, mm -hmm. precisely. Yeah, yeah. Is that all these books are emanating from the left, and they're all dystopic. And this kind of merges with Carter's own religious mm -hmm. view, which is interesting, because these, 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 these liberal authors would probably be atheists anyway. Mm -hmm. but, so, and, and, and uh, uh, Pat Cadell is giving him books on, you know, dystopic future to read. And this, you know, but he, but he gave him, he gave him uh, Christopher Lash's The Culture of Narcissism mm -hmm. to read. <clears throat> so, that, yeah. Nope. So, I mean, and this all produces the, the famous, mm -hmm. I won't call it infamous, because it wasn't evil, it was just misguided, the Malay speech, mm -hmm. uh, in which he really disconnects from the American people because he blames the American people for their problems instead of blaming government or, or corporate, cor corporations or anything else for their problems. He's blame, he blames the American people. Mm -hmm. And this just, Reagan's. Right, right. Yeah, right. Um, as you may know, Henry Olson has a, a forthcoming book out in which he argues that on domestic policy, Reagan really never changed from being a New Deal uh, anti-communist. Uh, I was interested if you, if your research uh, cor correlated his argument or if, if you could test it. Yeah, he has a book coming out. <laughs> <laughs> Reagan went to the Smithsonian uh, in 1984. There was an exhibit of FDR memorabilia, and as he came out, Sam Donaldson is yelling at him, yelling at him, said, you know, Mr. President, you want to tear apart the Great Society, or the New Deal, don't you want to tear apart the New Deal? And he wrote in his diaries that, that night, he said, I never wanted to destroy the New Deal. It was the Great Society I wanted to take apart. He was, he was in the 60s, he was against Social Security, he was against uh, uh, Medicare, but he later understood that they'd been so ingrained in the American culture and society, they weren't going to be reformed. And he was also a realist. He knew he could do what he could do, but he knew what he couldn't do. He didn't have control of the House of Representatives, not in eight years. And so the, on foreign policy, a president can do pretty much what he wants to do. And on, on the margins on domestic policy, especially like on, on tax cuts or, 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 or uh, uh, putting up a, a, a fence around the regulatory mm -hmm. state, which has really been underreported, Ed could tell you about that. But you know, there, there, there are static ways of looking at government versus freedom, then there are dynamic ways. You know, a lot of people say that, that Thomas Jefferson, in, in, in executing the Louisiana Purchase, violated his own political principles, which in a, in a static sort, sort of way, you'd say, yes, he did. But if you double the size of the government, but you don't double, or you double the size of the landmass of the country, but you don't double the size of the government, haven't you, in effect, 
diluted the impact of the national government on, the, on, on individuals. Reagan grew, the private economy in eight years grew six times faster than government. So it dilutes the influence on government, on the private sector, and on the private individual. Um, so there, he's anti-New Deal. He didn't propose. He didn't get, get rid of uh, 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 Social Security. didn't get rid of Medicare. Um, uh, he, there weren't many agencies. There was CETA and uh, Action and a couple others he was able to eliminate. Mm -hmm. But in no way was he, he was a devotee of Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, and he understood there were, that there were things that were going to exist that he couldn't do anything about. But he didn't propose new government programs either. Um, so th it's, a, it's more complicated than Henry has is, is, is written. It's, much, it's more sophisticated. It's just it's not either or. It's somewhere in the middle, and it requires a detailed explanation. It, but let me just say one thing, is that I, I'm all for all scholarship. Uh, more books on Reagan, more books on American president, I'm all for it. Right, but it, it is interesting how many people see Reagan through their own prism, whether it's Donald Trump or George Bush or you know any other political leader. They look at something, and and Reagan is so eponymous is that you know they, they well, Reagan was this. Reagan, I'm doing this because Reagan did this. I'm doing this because Reagan did this. You know, he's because he's so you know uh, he, 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 he so dominates the political debate even today with the new Republican president. Uh, <clears throat> uh, my question is uh, coming, uh, probably uh, taking a little into uh, account my background. I'm Russian, and I'm soon graduating as a Fulbright student and uh, will be working for Russian government. Um, I have to uh, uh, ask you about the uh, uh, creation of image of Reagan, in a sense that uh, he created a positive image, uh, he could create uh, an image that would be, you know, associated as a, with a force of nature, uh, inspirational images, um, and other things, you know, which really contrast with modern day uh, people like our country has to deal with on the, you know, on the on, on the on this side side of the Atlantic because sometimes there's like petty stuff, funny stuff. We don't know what's going on, and um, there's a, a profound difference in a sense that, say, when Reagan was president, people could watch his speech and translate, and they will be moved. Russian people would be moved. Yes. He had this uh, transcending power, uh, but modern politicians, modern American politicians, have sort of lost it. My question is. Uh, while you were researching probably this particular period, uh, or when do you think, maybe it's not Eureka College yet, there were some pretty bitter, pretty nasty Reagan that would also, you know, be found repellent by many people. But when did he find this particularly attractive, positive imagery that could attract and create this gravitational pull, not only with the people who liked him, before he started his national political uh, somebody, career. <laughs> this is going to take a while. I would never, ever attribute the words bitter or nasty to uh, Ronald Reagan. Maybe, maybe after 76, when he lost the nomination to Gerald Ford, Lynn Knopfler said he was, he was bitter. Uh, but, but only because he had perceived that Ford had used some underhanded tactics or some, uh, some questionable tactics to get the nomination. Don't forget, Reagan loses 76 by 67 delegate votes out of 2,269 ballots cast. And has, you know, if, if things go differently in a couple of primary states where Ford had used the power of the White House on these uh, about 150 uncommitted delegates, Reagan would have won the nomination. So Lynn Knopfsinger wrote at the time that, that Reagan, to his surprise, went back to California bitter, which you read a lot in that sentence, to his surprise. I mean, Lynn Knopfsinger, Mike Deaver, Peter Hanford, and Ed Meese knew the mind of Ronald Reagan better than any four men on the face of the earth. And they would probably resist the idea of, of, of assigning that word bitter to Ronald Reagan. He, he, he would accept you know, something, and then he'd go on. And he'd, he'd change his, his, his Delivery, or he'd think about something, or he'd write about it, whatever. But he was, he was, he was always in always in motion. Um, I, I also wouldn't say that there was somehow cultivated image of Ronald Reagan. Is that I don't think he ever. I never came across any time where you know he's huddled with his staff and says, "Well, I need to do this for my image." I mean, I just finished reading. Uh, my son and I, Andrew, are reviewing uh, Shattered, uh, the new book about. Hillary Clinton's 
Proud campaign. And every other page is that the campaign is huddling and says, well, her image isn't very good, so we need to do this. I don't think, did you ever you'd say, well, Reagan is bad? No, you say, well, we need to emphasize this issue. We need to emphasize that issue. But Reagan himself was just always just Reagan. You know, it's just, and I think that's why people liked him, because they sensed that he was just a naturally optimistic, decent human being. Uh, and we've had other politicians like that, too. I think that, you know, John Kennedy, people naturally liked because they thought he was an optimist and he was a, and he, and he inspired the American people and he, upli and he was upli gave uplifting speeches and uh, was, uh, did, uh, I think, a, a, a very good job under difficult circumstances, especially the, the missile crisis. I know there's another debate about that, but the fact is, is that Khrushchev did withdraw the missiles. I know that the post debate, you know, was was questionable about invading Cuba and all that. But the fact is, is that is that under the very very difficult circumstances, uh, and I'm getting off on a tangent, but is that whether it's Franklin Roosevelt or uh, or uh, uh, Reagan or Kennedy, they all projected an aura of optimism, of belief in the future. Um, the very phrase "rendezvous with destiny" is in Franklin Roosevelt's, thir which become, which is the title of one of my books, mm -hmm. and is is very, is, you know, Reagan used the phrase "rendezvous with destiny" of all of his, all of his important speeches, all 64, 80, 80 uh, acceptance speech in uh, in Detroit, and he gets this from Franklin Roosevelt in 1936. He's at WHO radio in Des Moines. He's known to his listeners as Dutch Reagan. and he's listening to FDR. And FDR is saying there's a mysterious cycle in human events. To some generations, much is given. Of other generations, much is expected. This generation of Americans has a rendezvous with destiny. And Reagan is infused with this. There's something heroic and magical about that phrase, rendezvous with destiny. So uh, is that, it, 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 but he was, always, he was optimistic before that. But now he's becoming, he's, he's intellectualizing it. He's, he's, he's articulating it. And, but but there was nothing anything of the phony about Ronald Reagan. He wouldn't have done it anyway. He wouldn't. Um, there were times where the campaign would try gimmicks or whatever. But I you know I could always tell that he wasn't really all that big on them. John Burlow of the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Uh, thank you, Craig, for uh, this is this this is uh, fa fascinating. And one of the things I'm most fascinated with with this period, and I wanted to get your take on this, how important they were were. Reagan's radio commentaries when he was sort of being like a pre-Rush Limbaugh, and the Hoover was <laughs> yeah. Hoover was involved in in the um, uh, uh, in Reagan in his own hand. That Martin, the late Martin Anderson, was a scholar there, where they discovered that his own handwritten radio scripts proving that these were, you know, his thoughts and he prepared these. It wasn't a ghost writer and it had, you know, the citations oh. of heritage and who and Hoover and, and things like that and scholars there. And just how important were these both in shaping the, Reagan's thinking and in, you know, giving, you know, sort of showing him to the American public? All right. Okay. The radio uh, speeches, which were, uh, which were conceived and executed by Peter Hannaford and Mike Deaver, uh, were five minute long. And this is before the era of the internet, where you could just record something and have it, you know, sent on the internet to a thousand different radio stations. Mm -hmm. He went to Harry O'Connor Studio, which was literally at the corner of Hollywood and Vine. <laughs> it really was, yeah. And he would record, and these were all five-minute commentaries. And he would record five, ten, fifteen in one setting, and and they would go out to radio stations. They'd go out by reel to reel, and also they'd go out by record. A little 45 record. Uh, and in radio stations all across America, stashed in their basement, are these 45 record albums hmm. of Ronald Reagan's commentaries. And they were five days a week. And he had, they had to plan ahead because the, you know, the issues might change in a week or two. So they had to do some foresight on what he was going to be talking about. Uh, he did 1,006 radio commentaries between 70, uh, 75 and 79, stopping for the 76 campaign. And then Starting right again in September of '76, uh, it, it, uh, they were they were five minutes long. He wrote pretty much everything as he did with his columns. Now he had help uh, with his with his uh, with his columns. I think a little bit with Peter and Mike. Sometimes Pat Buchanan would pitch in and help on a column. Ed obviously, uh, and I guess uh, Jeff Bell would pitch in occasionally. But but 99% of the columns. And uh, which went out to hundreds of newspapers syndicated by King Features, uh, and the radio addresses, which 
55 million people heard a week uh, is the 1006 five minute commentaries. And so this had enormous impact. And again, it was, an, it was a matter where America is listening to Ronald Reagan and the Washington elites are saying, Reagan who? Is that he's mm -hmm. developing a national following and Washington doesn't even know mm -hmm. about it. You know, with his speeches, with his columns, with his commentaries, with his uh, testifying before Congress, going on the Johnny Carson show, speaking at Young America's Foundation, spe uh, speaking at CPAC. And the national media is just, they're focused on the fact that this is a, this is a you know, what the, what the Republican elite said. This is a, he's too conservative, he's too old, he's too brittle. Mm -hmm. uh, what Gerald Ford once called him, you know, was that he was, uh, he, he once said that Reagan doesn't dye his hair, he's tur just turning prematurely orange. <laughs> Strikes me that you might want to <clears throat> make your next book about how many times Washington elites have gotten some basic things wrong. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Half yeah. Century that, right? that would be, yeah. that might take a lifetime to write. <laughs> I'd like to add a, uh, a bit to the, a response to the Russian question, if I may. And that is that Ronald Reagan, uh, as uh, Craig well knows, um, responded in large part to the plight of the people in the captive nations. And he offered them hope and freedom. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I once, um, uh, about six months after Havel came to power, uh, there was an international conference on democracy in Prague. And I ran the public relations for it. And there were, there were representatives there from the Warsaw Pact, from the Baltics, from Tiananmen Square, mm -hmm. uh, from all the oppressed countries of the world. They were all representatives there at this, the, this conference. And I was talking to a group of Hungarian journalists, and I said, I said, what inspired you? What kept you going? And they said, Reagan. Mm -hmm. Reagan's speeches we heard, you know, because they, they turned up the, they cranked up the frequency on Radio Free Europe to break through the uh, Soviet uh, jamming of the messages. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was Reagan. Mm -hmm. um, I. I think I recall reading in Charles Moore's biography of Margaret Thatcher, the first one, that um, when Reagan was running for president in 80, Margaret Thatcher was sort of plumping for him behind the scenes a little bit. Um, would you talk about their relationship in this period? And then also, um, I have a question about um, the whole co-president proposal with, with uh. Gerald Ford. <laughs> <laughs> Could you talk about that, too? Yeah, they first met in 1977. Ed was on the trip. Oh, you didn't go? Who was it? It was uh, Dick, uh, Dick Allen. and Peter. Peter, I think. Was. Yeah, Peter. Uh, and uh, she had just beat, defeated Edward Heath as the, um, mm -hmm. basically the minority leader of the parliament. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, Reagan recalled they met in a very tiny office there in parliament. She had nothing, you know. Mm -hmm. She didn't have a vast, you know, bureaucracy like a congressman does. It was mm -hmm. just her and an assistant. And, and they hit it off. Uh, they, they immediately saw eye to eye, and they were always uh, very, very friendly. They had their bumps. Uh, is that she got upset with him when we uh, 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 kicked the uh, Soviets out of Grenada. He did not call her ahead of time, and she, right. she, uh, she gave him uh, unshirted hell. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, too, is, is that uh, she didn't call Reagan uh, when she decided to commit the British military to the Falklands, and he returned the favor by giving her a little bit of a uh, brushback pitch. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, she's, you know, she was one of the speakers at the funeral, is that they were... They were they were ideological soulmates, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, is that you know? In fact, uh, I think she in one of her biographies called Reagan her best friend. Uh, so is that they were they were pretty much inseparable in their view of the world, their view of the marketplace, their view of of individual freedom and rights and dignity. Uh, oh, oh, the co-presidency. Um, okay, this is going to take a while. <laughs> Reagan's main challenger for the 1980 nomination emerges as Ambassador George Bush. Everybody, the Washington elites all said, well, Howard Baker would be the best Republican nominee. And then the editorial writer said, well, John Connolly looks like a president, whatever, <laughs> whatever that means, you know, is that, uh, is that but Reagan is, 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 the, is on his way to the nomination in Detroit. And Ed and the fellows are casting around for a running mate for Reagan. And, and, and Mrs. Reagan and Governor Reagan wanted Paul Laxalt. Uh, he, was, he, was, he, was a, he was a friend. He was loyal. He was a Westerner. But there was the matter of 
first of all, Nevada only had three electoral votes. And there was the messy matter of Nevada being the only state in the country with legalized gambling and legalized prostitution. Uh, and this would have been difficult to explain to the family groups uh, that, were, that were supporting them in Detroit, is that a lot of the staff wanted Jack Kemp. But uh, two things about Jack, and he was a wonderful, wonderful person. He brought fire to Republican kind. He, the, the party owes him a tremendous debt. But there, was two, there were several things. One is, is that uh, he was seen as, uh, A, as too young, and also he was, in the words of some Reagan staffers, they thought he was uncontrollable. Uh, the other thing was, was that this is 1980, and it was going to be difficult to sell to the American people a ticket of a former actor and a former pro football player. <laughs> so this and other reasons, um, this and other reasons, uh, they, they, uh, uh, Reagan really liked Jack. He really did. Um, but it, so anyway, is that they're, they're, they're winnowing down the process. Now, the obvious choice to, to most people is, uh, is George Bush, because he comes second in, for the nomination, because he was more moderate than Reagan, because he had more foreign, po foreign policy credentials than Reagan. And it would produce a unified convention, which was still the dominant thinking. This is that you know the conservative Reagan is going to be the nominee, so you've got to bring the moderates along, so you pick a George Bush to unify the party. The problem is, is that Ronald Reagan and, George, and uh, Nancy Reagan don't want George Bush, and they really uh, didn't like George Bush, truth be known, truth be known, is that, you know, Reagan, the age was a big issue in 1980. He was 69. And it, it was in every story about Reagan. You know, Reagan is too old. Reagan's back at the ranch. Reagan did miss the debates, blah, 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 blah. It goes on. And so George Bush is, meanwhile, jogging all the time, jogging for the cameras. He's jogging <laughs> in his shorts in New Hampshire in January. You know, is this? He's, you know, this, but he's do, he's jogging all the time, and he's doing this obviously to exacerbate the issue about Reagan's age, and this really, really ticked off Mrs. Reagan. And then there were other things too. Uh, there were there were other things too about uh, is that they but they were constantly poking at the age issue. They're constantly you know prodding it. You know, uh, uh, you know, it, Bush would get a question in New Hampshire and say. You know, some from the audience, it was obviously a plant. You know, some would say, well, don't you think 69 is too old to be president? He would cleverly answer, he said, well, let the voters make that decision. I'm 55. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, it was, and so this, by the time they get to Detroit, uh, is that is the, the, they really don't want George Bush, even though he's the obvious choice to a lot of people. And so the whole idea comes up about picking Gerald Ford to do what George Bush would have done, which would be unify the party. And this all just gets out of control. And Ed can tell you chapter and verse, he was there for the whole time at ground zero, negotiating with Bill Casey, and negotiating with Henry Kissinger, and, and with everybody. And uh, uh, is that it, it, the, basically the Ford people take over the negotiations. And Henry, of course, wants to be returned to Secretary of State in a Reagan administration. The only problem is Reagan doesn't like Kissinger, doesn't like Detente. Uh, uh, and you know, Henry's you know, writing who, you know, who's going to be named White House Gardener. And, uh, it, it, but it, it literally, it's a, it's a power grab. And this is just spinning out of control, all there under the glare of national television, to the point where Ford goes on CBS with Walter Cronkite. And Walter Cronkite, live on national television, is negotiating on behalf of Ford with the Reagan campaign. And, and then he finally says, says, well, Mr. President, what you're talking about sounds like a co-presidency. And, and Ford says, yeah, I guess it is what is co-presidency. And Reagan is up in his suite with Ed and with Dick, Allen, and others. And, and he, he jumps up. He said, did you hear what he just said? And now he's, but he's, got, he's stuck with, it, with this tar baby. He's got to get rid of it. And what really, really happens is, is that you know Peter Hanford once told me sometimes Reagan would just let things play out uh, and, and, and to reach their logical conclusion. So really, it was Ford who took himself out of contention. But because mm -hmm. the negotiation has become so uh, you know uh, so minute, you know so so mm -hmm. grinding, so tiny, everything like this is that it just became completely unworkable. Plus the fact uh, they both were from California which the 11th commandment would have 
uh, 12th commandment. Ford was a California. Yeah, he was, he was, he was so California's 45 yeah. delegate votes would have been, would have mm -hmm. been you know, nullified. Mm -hmm. So finally at the end, Ford takes himself out of contention, um, which Reagan is relieved, and then he picks up the phone and calls George Bush. Uh, but it was it was very very. I mean, the, 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 this almost destroyed Reagan's nomination. It almost got out of control. There was almost a runaway convention. I was, I was there. I was the youth uh, person uh, in the Texas and if delegation. You weren't even born then. Come yeah, on. exactly, exactly. Well, I will yeah, tell you. Top, that's a compliment. I weighed uh, I weighed 135 then. Let's say that. Uh, but I was there with the delegation. I was the only person under 25 trav there at the Book Cadillac Hotel, and our leader was Jimmy Lyon who was the chairman of River Oaks Bank, and a man, a very, very, uh, Ernie very Angelo. deep guy. Yeah. And Ernie Angelo was the younger, crew-cut, you know, oil guy from Midland or Odessa or whatever. Right. But Jimmy Lyon was sort of the very sedate uh, banker from Houston. And there was a runaway caucus, there was a caucus, a rump caucus that night. And I was there, and people had already had a couple of cocktails when this whole thing burst out. And it was, you know, 10 o'clock at night, and there were 100 people in that room, all the delegates, all the uh, uh, assistant delegates uh, or backups. And uh, there, was, there was, I mean, there was like a whiff in the air that was like, this thing's going up. And people were like, we are out of here. This, we're never going to stand for this because these are people who had fought Ford in 76. Right. And it right. lived and under it was still bitter people. feelings. Mm -hmm. and, and all they were. Bitter. So, um, and, and Reagan had won Texas both times, and, and Jimmy Lyon walked up to the front of the room, you know, the pinstripe suit, very dapper, jacket buttoned, and he said, people, I'm going to tell you like this. We've been with Ronald Reagan in 76. We've been with Ronald Reagan this year, and we're sticking with Ronald Reagan, and we are not walking out on Ronald Reagan in his time of need. And everyone who wants to stick with Ronald Reagan, you're sticking with me. And it, it, the whole room just went, he just sucked all the oxygen out of the room. It yeah. was a, a magnificent thing to see at, during that convention. Mm -hmm. anyway. Gary Hoisman was there, too. I remember. Were you in the room, Gary? Well, I don't remember being in the room. That time. That's, that's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I remember a lot of tears among the Texas delegates. <laughs> <laughs> in light of today's pretty negative politics, what would the great communicator give advice to Donald Trump? <laughs> Good question. Um, would Ronald Reagan tweet? <laughs> yes, he would. Yes, he would. Okay. Yes, he would. I'll tell you why. Is that Reagan understood that technology was the essential element in communications, and that to communicate great ideas, you needed technology. Reagan, in the 19, early 1930s, Commercial radio is a new venture, and yet he mm -hmm. masters it. Mm -hmm. Talking pictures in the late 30s are a new development, and yet he masters it. Is that mm -hmm. the te commercial television in the 1950s is a new development, yet he masters it. He masters the press conference, he masters the sound bite, all, that, all the aspects, radio commentaries, uh, mm -hmm. all the aspects of, that go into the technology, go into communication, he mastered. Uh, he was, and he was fascinated by technology. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and if he was alive today, I'm convinced he would use Facebook and Twitter and Twitter, t Twitter, whatever it is. <laughs> I don't do it. I don't. I don't do it. I don't do it. I don't understand it. Um, <laughs> I, I just, I, yeah, I know. I know, I know. <laughs> I'm there, I'm there. Yeah. Um, but he would use, use tech, he wouldn't yeah. say what Trump is saying, uh, but he would use technology to communicate his ideas and, mm -hmm. and, and increase his following. Mm -hmm. Sure. And what would he tell Trump? Uh, I guess the nice version. Can you do a Reagan imitation? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, well, <laughs> um, I would say that he would say, "Read your mail." Mm -hmm. You oh. know, Reagan read his mail every day. He didn't read all of mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. He didn't read all of it, but he would get what do you get? A dozen letters a day. More than that. More than that. And he would he, he read all of them, and a lot of them. He wrote letters to. Mm -hmm. He wrote letters to people, and I think he gained a perspective uh, to the American people that alluded to the politicians. Great, uh, and he also Newton? he would say to get out of Washington as often as possible yeah. and go out there and meet with the American people. That's what he would mm -hmm. tell Donald Trump. Didn't Peggy Noonan once um, write a beautiful piece about a woman who they had a correspondence of, over a number of years? I forget her name, but she started writing letters. He wrote back, and they actually 
had a wonderful kind of a rap. Well, he had two fan clubs. Yeah. Uh, and both these, uh, one was in Philadelphia, I can't remember their names, and one was in New York and Brooklyn. And he, over the course of 40 years, mm -hmm. they collected hundreds of Reagan letters. And, w and now the Young America's Foundation has one set, right? Mm -hmm. The other set is at the library, I think. Maybe. Yeah. But I know Young America's Foundation out at the mm -hmm. Reagan Ranch mm -hmm. has one set uh, from his, uh, his his fan yeah. club in, in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And it was hundreds of, hundreds of letters. Um, there's also a story about Reagan uh, getting a letter or he read a story. He used to get news clips too, local news clips, not just the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, but from the heartland. Mm -hmm. And he either got this letter or he read this story, but it was about a woman, for some reason she made, she, she was hurting. Uh, and he was, this was 82 or something like this during the, mm -hmm. the, the recession. And so he wrote her a check for $100. And now, believe it or not, the President of the United States balanced his checkbook. And a, a month later, he's balancing his checkbook, and she hasn't deposited the check. Mm -hmm. So he calls her. And he says, well, what gives? She said, well, first of all, I didn't believe it was from you. And then I realized it was from you. So I was going to keep it as a souvenir. <laughs> <laughs> Reagan says, Reagan says, he says, look. I'll send you a second check, but don't cash both of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. All right, I think we're going to end on that high note. So please join me in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah.